Hello, I'm Darren McGee. Today's topic comes from a question asking if I would outline some of the common signs of a sadistic partner. Now, sadism could be characterized as having a desire to inflict pain and misery on others for pleasure or to assert dominance. And although sadistic personality is no longer part of the DSM, there has been renewed interest in its research. Sadism has a high comorbidity rate with other personality types. It's part of what's known as the dark tetrad, which includes three other personality types. Alongside sadism, there is psychopathy, which is being callous and having a disregard for the well-being and the safety of others. There's narcissism, which includes a sense of entitlement, being highly disagreeable and a lack of empathy for others. And there's Machiavellianism, which is being both manipulative and duplicitous. And sadism can manifest in different ways. There's physical, which can include physically hurting someone or damaging their property. There's verbal, which can include shouting, screaming or saying things to embarrass and humiliate. And there is vicarious, which is deriving pleasure from fantasizing about or watching others suffer. So today I'm going to outline and give examples of sadistic behaviours in a relationship and how that sadism co-occurs with the other components of the dark tetrad. The following examples do not necessarily mean that someone has sadistic personality, but they would be strongly associated with sadism. And also these examples would be occurring regularly in the relationship. And in the examples I will be referring to a sadist and the partner. So sign number one is how the partner is never good enough. The sadist keeps their partner in a constant state of insecurity. They might make constant criticisms over their appearance, their integrity, their intelligence or their abilities. They constantly try to make the partner feel inferior to them and to others. They might compare them unfavorably to potential partners or ex-partners. They might imply or threaten infidelity just to keep the partner in a state of insecurity. The sadist indicates that they could have that person, they could have any person, whereas the partner is too unattractive for anyone else to be interested in them. And if the sadist were to cheat, it's not necessarily about sexual pleasure. There is also the satisfaction of causing pain to their partner. The partner's not good enough, doesn't satisfy them. In some cases, they don't even keep the affair secret. They want the partner to feel betrayed, hurt and inadequate. This kind of behaviour is not just about causing the partner pain and misery, it's also about dominance and control in the relationship. Sadis wants the partner to know that not only are they better and of more value, so are others. Now that being said, the second sign would be they can exhibit excessive jealousy and possessiveness. They monitor their partner's every move, they isolate them from friends and family. Dominance and control are central themes in the behaviour of people with sadistic traits. They often assert their power over their partners, try to control various aspects of their lives, including their decisions, their actions, their social interactions. So they might set strict rules, dictate their appearance, dictate their activities, limiting their freedom and their autonomy. Here you would see the jealous, the envious and the controlling side of narcissism. Punishment for any kind of autonomy or deviation from the rules can be harsh. That being said though, the punishment can be withheld until later on. For instance, if the couple were out at an event and the partner were to do or say something that they don't approve of, for instance they talk to someone that the sadist doesn't like or they laugh at something the sadist didn't find that funny, they can feel angry but they can hold it in until the couple get home and then let all hell fly loose. Another sign of a sadistic partner is how they take pleasure when others are in distress or face some kind of misfortune. Now this could be someone being in a car accident or losing their job or perhaps even just tripping over something on the floor. They might just burst out laughing or they might seek more information as to what happened, not out of concern, but to further fuel their excitement. If the partner doesn't see it the same way as they do, well, there's something wrong with the partner. They don't get it. Which leads me on to sign number four which is unkind, often cruel humour. Now this is not to be confused with playful banter between two people. This can involve demeaning nicknames, ridicule and insults disguised as jokes. There can even be cruel pranks such as perhaps shaking a ladder when the partner is at the top of it or hiding something important that belongs to the partner, something they need. It can also be belittling or mocking the partner's emotions or dismissing their concerns as being trivial or irrelevant. The thing about this kind of humour is that generally no one except the sadist finds these kind of things funny. But the intent behind the humour is not to amuse others, 
The intent is to cause distress and humiliate the partner for their own amusement. Next, a sadist can enjoy publicly embarrassing their partner. They might share the partner's personal information, their private secrets with others. For instance, if the partner were ill, the sadist might not necessarily share the information about them being ill with those that have a concern. Rather, they might go into graphic detail about the partner's symptoms, how the illness affects them. This involves deliberately ignoring the partner's privacy and downplaying their distress, undermining their sense of self-worth. Next, there is the controlling of resources, support and options. Now, the sadist may claim they're better at handling money, and they may well be, but they limit the amount of money the partner can have, even if it's their own money. Whatever they do allow the partner to have, they might behave as if they're being generous. The sadist is in control and can feel a huge amount of satisfaction when the partner has to ask for anything. The more autonomy, the more options the partner has, the less in control the sadist feels. So if the partner were to want to do anything for themselves, perhaps meet up with friends or enroll in a course or join a club, the sadist might do everything they can to prevent it or to sabotage it. They might refuse them the time. They might refuse them the finances. They might claim they have something planned at the same time, which is much more important. They might even just hide their car keys so that they can't leave. And here we would see the manipulative side of the personality. Sign number seven is how during arguments with a sadistic person they try to intimidate to get their own way. They want the partner to know that they are the alpha in the room and they can react strongly to any kind of challenge. They can be quite forceful, make glaring eye contact, maybe have their face really close to their partners while they're arguing, while they're shouting. They might make threats and make it clear they will follow those threats through, sometimes maybe even daring the partner to test them. And sign number eight is actually causing arguments, but leaving them unresolved. A sadistic person can tolerate the tension and the instability in the relationship. In fact, more often than not, they thrive off it, but they know that the partner can't. Sometimes the arguments are over nothing, maybe something trivial or irrelevant. But the argument isn't really important. The argument is designed to both hurt the partner and to keep them in a state of fear and vigilance. If the partner were to try to avoid an argument, give in, back down, give them what they want, the sadist might still provoke, still accuse, still find fault. If the partner were to plead with them for it to stop, they'll continue, sometimes even ramp the cruelty up a gear. Sadistic people can be relentless in their attacks. There's no let up. It's all about domination and control, so rarely do they give their partners a break. And here we see the disregard and the callousness often associated with psychopathy. They might even claim the partner was trying to bully them. They're only standing up for themselves. And again, here we see the manipulation. Some people have reported that when being brought to almost breaking point, for a brief moment, catching what they described as almost like a glint of excitement in the eyes of their abuser. Another form of sadistic behaviour is destroying property. For instance, if the partner were to buy a new item of clothing and hang it in the wardrobe, the sadistic person might take that item of clothing, maybe cut it with scissors, even just a little bit, then hang it back in the wardrobe. Now the partner knows they did it, but to confront them would be met with denial and accusations of them being crazy that would follow maybe a huge massive argument. In many cases, victims have had to learn to hide anything of value to themselves as best they can. Sign number 10 is when in a relationship with a person with very strong sadistic traits, the partner is blamed and punished for everything that goes wrong. Partners are blamed for anything the kids do that they don't approve of. They're punished for the kind of day they had at work. Even if their own behaviour gets them into trouble outside of the relationship, or they forget to do something important like pay a bill, it is the partner who is held to account for it and punished. They want the partner to feel the pain, if not more so, as if this is going to alleviate their own. And here we see the blame shifting and the projection, often associated with narcissism. Next, there is parental alienation, and this typically happens when a couple separate. However, it can still happen when they're still together. They teach the children they don't have to listen to or respect the other parent. They are the one they have to obey and respect. Any rule or boundary the partner puts down, they might allow, even encourage the kids to break it. They continually undermine the other parent to show the children that they are the ones with the power and control. The other parent has none. 
in cases where there is a separation, they try to turn the children against the other parent. And there are different ways they can do this. They might just show displeasure or low mood any time the other parent spends time with them. They might complain about how unfairly they have been treated by the other parent just to elicit sympathy, make the other parent look like a villain. Or they might show anger any time the kids spend time with the other parent. So the children begin to fear contact with the other parent. And lastly, many people who have been in abusive relationships have reported that it was at the end of the relationship, just as they were leaving or after they had left, that the abuse intensified. Here we not only see the callous side of the dark personality, but also the narcissistic side. And what I mean by that is, although it's not mentioned in the DSM, narcissistic people can be both very vindictive and competitive. If the partner leaves, they feel as if they've lost control. They want that person back to be able to control them. They also want to punish them. Sadistic behaviours are all about inflicting pain and causing misery. If they can't hurt the person in the relationship, they will try to hurt them outside of it. There is just this need to win their war of attrition. In extreme cases, their pursuit of vengeance can be both relentless and vicious. So to summarize sadism, especially when it's co-occurring with traits such as psychopathy, narcissism and Machiavellianism, can be destructive and painful for others, especially those closest to them. There can be little to no reprieve for the partner. Their cruelty can be relentless even when the partner is complying. They can be constantly antagonistic, engage in cruel, demeaning behaviours. They can punish for their own misfortune. They can do it out of envy. Sometimes they do it just for their own pleasure. And this is how they dominate. The partners can become so worn down, too tired, sometimes too frightened to argue back because of the constant barrage of malice. In real extreme cases, any pain or distress experienced by the partner can bring excitement and joy to them, especially if they have caused it. And finally, a lack of empathy doesn't mean no empathy. Many people with dark personality have a cognitive empathy, sometimes referred to as a dark empathy. They know what hurts, why it hurts, and how to hurt. I heard someone recently describe it as, they have a level of empathy, but no sympathy. So that's just a brief outline of some of the signs of a partner with sadistic traits and qualities. Now, if there's anything I've missed, anything you'd like to add, please use the comment section below. There are some interesting conversations start from these videos. But if you'd like to learn more about sadistic personality, I have made videos previously on the different subtypes if you'd find those interesting. But if you found this video interesting, please consider subscribing to my channel. And until next time, thanks for watching.